Hello, and welcome to MICA's Risk Management Program online coaching series, Module 2 on Consent. The objectives of this module include that the participants will be able to discuss informed consent and how it applies to the patient's self determination. Also, to explain the different types of consent, who may give consent, and why a patient has the right to refuse treatment. The definition of consent is simply the voluntary agreement by a person who possesses sufficient mental capacity to make an intelligent choice to allow something proposed by another to be performed. In other words, in medicine, it's typically allowing someone to provide a treatment or a procedure on you after you have sufficient information to understand the choice and whether or not you should have that procedure done. Types of consent. There are three types of common consent. One is express consent, implied consent, and informed consent, and we'll go through kind of the definition of each of those. Express consent is when you have a verbal or written agreement authorizing treatment. A simple example of that, those may be when you first go to see a doctor, a new practitioner that you've not seen before. You walk into the doctor's office, you go and sit down and you're seen by the doctor and he treats you. You may have signed some initial patient treatment forms, but when you first walked in, you didn't have those. You were there because you were expressing your consent to be seen. Implied consent. That's where there's a presumption that consent has been authorized by the patient, possibly because the patient's inability to provide consent for the medical condition requiring treatment. Some examples of that might be unconscious, unconscious patients that are presumed under law to um, be approved for emergency treatment in situations. So if you're in a car accident and you're um, not conscious, you come into the ED, it's expressed, it's implied that they're allowed to treat you. Uh, comatose state due to multiple injuries is another example. And you want to make sure that you document the patient's status in the medical record um, so that it's clear why you proceeded with the treatment without written consent of the patient. Informed consent really is a legal concept that the patient has a right to know the potential risk, benefits, and alternatives of the proposed treatment. It does require that the patient have a full understanding um, of that to which they're consenting to and that should be in the patient's primary language. So obviously, you want to communicate in the level that the patient understands, in the language they understand, and giving them all of the information they need to make a good decision. Proof of consent can be really three different ways, oral consent, written consent, or the implied emergency consent we described earlier. It's often best, if you can, to have written consent because that can be relied upon at a later time if there's a court issue and it's a document that's retrievable versus a person who witnessed an oral consent may not be available at a later time to verbalize they recall that event. Evidence of consent. This involves the nature of the patient's illness or injury. You want to make sure that that's clear on the consent form. You want the name of the proposed procedure or treatment, for example, an appendectomy, whatever it may be, and the purpose of the proposed tr treatment or procedure, as well as the risk and possible consequences of the treatment. You also want to have the alternatives of those. What should written consent include? It should include the alternative methods of treating the patient, including their associated risk and benefits. What are the risk and prognosis if no treatment is undergone? If the patient decides, I don't want to undergo that treatment, I'm willing to move forward or do something different or not have any treatment at all. Also, an indication that the patient understands the nature of the proposed treatment, its alternatives, the risk, and the possible consequences of that treatment. Of course, you'll want the signatures of the patient, the physician, the PA, the NP, or who is ever uh, performing the procedure, as well as all of the witnesses involved. And obviously, date is needed on the consent form to know when that consent was completed. Capacity to consent. This is the clinical assessment of decision making. Does the patient have the capacity? And that should include the patient's ability to understand the risk benefits and alternatives of the procedure and to evaluate the information provided by the practitioner, by the PA, the MD, or the NP. It's very important that they have the ability to understand what they're being told, and if they can't, they're really not able to consent. They should be able to voluntarily make decisions about their treatment plan without any undue influence from family, friends, or other medical personnel.
Before declaring an individual incapacitated, the attending physician must really determine with reasonable degree of medical certainty that the patient does lack capacity. They'll want to make a notation in the medical record and state the reason why they believe the patient is incapacitated so it's clear why they felt they could not make that decision. Who may consent? Competent patients, as we discussed, may consent. A patient's legal guardian or their representative and minors with some exceptions. There are many exceptions to minors that may consent for themselves. And so for a list of all of the minor exceptions, please see the MICA website for further information or also feel free to call the MICA hotline for further guidance. Let's now discuss the patient's right to refuse treatment. Patients not only have the right to consent to treatment, but they also have the right to refuse treatment. A competent adult patient has the right to decline all forms of medical treatment, intervention, and that includes life-saving or life-prolonging treatments. Sometimes that's a really difficult decision when patients reach that for physicians, nurse practitioners, and all caregivers. However, it is a patient's right, ultimately, to make the decision to refuse treatment if they're competent. As always, please feel free to call MICA hotline for any related questions related to consent, and this concludes Module 2, Consent. Thank you.